hope that uh, <laughs> you're feeling calm. And if you're not, we have a great episode for you today. Oh, that threw me off. It's kind of an ASM- ASMR, ASMR Cause episode. Usually, Cause usually you're like, hi everybody. How's it going? What's yeah. going on everybody? Um, we have a, uh, a really nice episode for you today. Nice. Uh, our, our guest Ryan Haddon is a very impressive person who yeah. does spiritual life coaching. She's a hypnotist and meditation teacher. And we talk a lot about self love today and how, uh, it sounds so cliche self love. Oh, I love yourself. Love thyself. And yet we don't. And we get into the specifics of what she means by that, how we can do it, the role it plays on our relationships, uh, in life, whether it's our friendships or romantic relationships. And, uh, if we are, and able to recognize uh, how we love ourselves or lack thereof, how it's kind of a non-starter for your other relationships going forward. So I, I really enjoyed uh, talking to Ryan, and uh, she has a very soothing voice. Very and, uh, soothing. It's probably part of the hypnosis aspect of what she does. Oh, it's, do you think maybe we were hypnotized during this conversation? No. Okay. I don't know, maybe. I don't. Is that? Do you, what do you think? I don't know. If you start barking like a dog later, I'll be excited. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I really think uh, I feel like, it, and we try to mix it up with our guests, as you guys as know, and uh, hopefully you guys will feel a little more cleansed yeah. after this itself. You also might be more anxious, being like realizing all the work you have to do for yourself. But yeah. who knows? Either way, it starts somewhere. Uh, we really enjoy Ryan taking the time and we certainly hope that you guys enjoy, uh, listening to this episode as much, uh, as I, uh, enjoy talking to Ryan. So let's, uh, let's get to Ryan. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for joining. That's great to be here. I have, uh, I have so many questions for you. Um, so I guess let's just, let's just get into it. Um, let's do it. So you are certified life and spiritual coach hypnotist and meditation teacher and i mean i'm slightly familiar with meditation i've i mean okay. i'm i'm familiar with uh hypnosis in the sense that like we've all heard of it in fact you know my high school graduation they brought in a hypnotist i haven't been able to get hypnotized twice it was once when i was a freshman and then my senior my graduation they brought in like a hypnotist for the school and like did this whole like student body thing and both times they try to hypnotize me didn't work for me you know other people they totally out of body experience it was hard for me to believe because it didn't work on me right. but so i have so many questions about that and then obviously the life coaching but before we get into all that i mean i want i want to learn a little bit about yourself and how you got into all these things was it something that you uh, new on an early age or through your own personal experiences kind of and kind of self-preservation of finding uh, yourself because a lot of what you do it seems to be is getting the most out of one's self or you know living your best life so to speak is that accurately put sure it's a great that's a great phrase live your best life who doesn't want that yeah but that's elusive right it's a concept Mm -hmm. Um, and that obviously changes each person's got a different idea of what that means for them. Um, so yeah, I help people figure out what that means and what's in the way. And I use all those modalities you called out to, um, help them unpack and clear what's, what's noise, what's subconscious patterning and programming, what are like mental blocks, what's childhood conditioning, those sorts of parts and pieces. And then the meditation and spiritual pieces, like let's grow out the the part of you that is intact your higher self the part of you that has a soul the part that's wise and all-knowing and let's grow that out and then meanwhile clear all these other things out of the way and really get you on that track to figure out what your best life is and how can you move into alignment with that yeah and and how did you get into that doing it um well i was i guess i was a seeker at a young age i had a parent pass in my teens and that was their great blessing is that they left me with the question of what, why are we here and what are we doing? So instead of going into a, a spiraling into a grief depression, it sent me on a quest and it led me to a meditation teacher, which wasn't popular amongst my friends, <laughs> but um, 
I, I went off to India and ended up studying in India for a couple of years. And really? I took my GED there and my SATs there and, you know, just sort of really wanted to have that full immersion. And I did. And I studied a lot of the the Indian traditions and how chanted ago, all the chants. And how long that was, I was, was 17, that? 17 okay. years old. So it's good. What is 30 some years? Okay. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. And like when you say it wasn't it as was popular with your friends is, you know, meditation has become a little <laughs> no. bit more mainstream and it has. Uh, accepted in our culture. But yeah, 30 years ago, not, not so no. much for you. People not so you're much. Nuts. Yeah. You're crazy. Yeah, they totally did. They totally did. But for some reason I knew what I was doing and it was a good, it was an incredible fertile period in my life. Learned a lot of different um, parts about transcendental meditation and, you know, having these incredible experiences. And then, so then I went back into college and had to try to fold that in. And that was a real, that was a huge challenge for me to try to make a practical spirituality for myself. And that led me to a lot of um, dark nights of the soul. I'll be honest. I actually um, went into alcoholism for a period of time in my twenties and that was rough roads and having to reconcile what I once was in India and this other version of me that's very real and, you know, um, really hard to crawl, crawl your way out of. Um, and that during that time, I met a lot of mentors and people who were pointing the different directions. And I was so very grateful for the, for the paths that the paths that they led me to that. I think that made a huge impression on me and, later on in my life, when I started to really get things together and integrate all those different learnings, I really enjoyed helping others do that. And I found that that was one of my purposes. And that was part of me creating my best life was being in service to others and then developing all these modalities so that I could help them. And I will continue to find more modalities to do that. Do you like having sex with music? I do. Mm -hmm. Well, do just you have to turn want to stream free? Amazon Music still has over a million podcast episodes at no charge. Would you want to fuck while listening to a podcast along with thousands of stations no. and top playlists? For a limited time, you can get your first three months of Amazon Music Unlimited for free. That's access to 70 million songs so you can play the songs you want when you want while having sex on demand and ad free for free for three months. I'm just saying. Like, Could you imagine having... Uh, a wonderful time making love and your favorite songs come on. And then all of a sudden a quick break for our sponsors. You don't want commercials no. while you're listening to music. So get it. Amazon music for free, commercial free, unlimited 70 million songs. But also cool. you could find yourself having sex just all of a sudden and want some music and just be, be like, like play, play John Mellencamp. <laughs> Or Richard Marks. <laughs> You're going to love Amazon Music Unlimited as much as I do. Take advantage of this incredible offer today. For a limited time, you can get three months of Amazon Music Unlimited for free. Go to Amazon.com slash V-I-A-L-L. That's Amazon.com slash V-I-A-L-L for your first three months of Amazon Music for free. Starts at $7.99 a month after new subscribers only. Terms apply Offers expires 1-11-2021. Well, I love wine, people. I have this beautiful wine rack at my new home. It's it's visually stimulating. And um, it is nice. I also like learning a lot about the wine I'm drinking. I like sounding smarter than I am. And Bright Cellars not only is giving you great wine and at your convenience, because it's a subscription, they send you wine, that they give you these nice little notes about the wine that you're getting so you can sound smarter than you are. You can talk about the notes in your wine and where it comes from and the flavors that come up and what you should eat it with and pair it with and you'll just impress your friends all while drinking delicious wine you take a quick quiz you find out what wines you want that you found delicious find delicious their algorithm analyzes your quiz results and the taste profile that you like and it recommends wines that you're going to love based off your tastes you did that quiz. It didn't did. take you long was, as, at I, all. I did it like in a minute and a half. They yeah. sent me some wine. I'll tell you what, love the wine that they have. I they sent you the six bottle service. Some Cabernets. I got some Vinos. I got, uh, I believe, a Chardonnay. And uh, it's the wines I've never had or tried before. And I get these little cards and they sound like fucking smart. And it's great. You probably sound really hot on a date if you're oh, like my. talking about the wine. Like, God. oh, this is the wine I got. Mostly I'm just drinking it by myself. But yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a company from Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Yeah. Love that. 
Midwest company. They have hundreds of private label wines and are adding more every month. Uh, they have personalized wine concierge team that is available to answer any questions you have and concerns about uh, your membership. Uh they have a delight guarantee. So if you do not like a bottle that their algorithm says that you will, you will uh, be able to send a replacement in the next box. So they back up their uh, their recommendations. And I tell you what, I haven't, I haven't run into a bottle of wine I haven't thoroughly enjoyed. Bright Cellars is a wine subscription service that lets you skip the store and brings amazing wines right to your door. By taking a seven-question quiz, it takes 30 seconds, Bright Cellar uses an algorithm that pairs you with wines based on your personal preferences. They help source brand new wines you may have not otherwise tried, and that is super fun. Use the discount link to get your first six bottles of Bright Cellars box for 50% off. Visit brightcellars.com slash V-I-A-L-L, and you will receive 50% off your first six bottle box. B-R-I-G-H-T-C-E-L-L-A-R-S dot com slash V-I-A-L-L for 50% off your first six bottle box. So what are some of the biggest struggles that you find people deal with that kind of create their own struggles? I mean, we've we've had episodes where we talk about the key to happiness and things like that, and it sounds like this is a bit intertwi- intertwined. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, we all mm-hmm. want to be happy, but uh, it sounds like maybe you deal with some of the actual you know struggles that people find or just we all kind of have um destructive behaviors you even kind of mentioned like for you you know you had this whole life in india came back and tried to uh, intertwine east and west philosophies and then you just kind of got into your you know you said your you know dark soul whatever Mm -hmm. and we, you know, in different versions, we all do that. We have our strengths and weaknesses. And so you're trying, you know, what are some of those things that you find with people that they really struggle with? I think people underestimate their relationship to themselves. I think we spend a good deal of time running from that very um, tenuous <laughs> relationship. And so we think it's the person that someone else is going to fix that or someone else is going to make us feel better. We ask other people to take care of our needs and wants and our emotional um, through line. And so when you really get, which I had to get to recover from a deadly disease, that my relationship to myself was something I was done running from. Mm -hmm. And I had to anchor into that in a different way and really create a kinder climate. You know, the, the, the climate of those sorts of addictions or acting out or seeking external um, things to hold you up is the climate of self-loathing in the extreme, right? You're just absolutely in this boiling cauldron of I'm not enough. It's I'm, I'm, I can't get things done. I don't have purpose. I don't know who I am. I don't like myself. It's like, that's you to recover from that. You're going to, the antidote is starting to grow out kinder ways of speaking to yourself, more compassion, noticing the good, to taking, you know, being of service, doing actionable ways that move the self-esteem needle forward, if you will. So that sure. was my antidote. And I had to do that to save my life, which um, many of us have had to do um, to varying degrees. But so yeah. that's, so I would term, say, the yeah, thing. That... People come to me for different things. Can you help me get the job? Can you help me be happy in my relationship? And I always start with, let's figure out what the relationship to you is first. And let's deep sure. dive into that. And from there, when that's in place, everything else starts to flow. The purpose comes, the relationship gets better. You know, I've had people come to me and say, can you help me, you know, um, leave this relationship with my husband? I'm not happy in it. And I say, well, let's figure out, let's tweak a few things with how you deal with yourself. And then you'll know more whether that's something you actually want to do or not. And I'd say more times than not, people end up staying in that relationship and they have decided to take responsibility for themselves within it. And so they're not leaning on to their partner to be their everything. They're understanding that only they have the power to meet those needs and then share themselves with that partner from that place. Sure. Yeah. And so the relationship with yourself, like you said, a lot of it, you said is coming from a place of self-loathing. And I guess it sounds, you know, I always kind of love those things that, um, when you say it out loud, it sounds simple and it makes a ton of sense. And yet it's something that so many of us take for granted or don't even consider, Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we, every week, every episode, we're, we're talking and dealing with people who talk about their relationships with other people, friendships, uh, mm -hmm. boyfriends, girlfriends, et cetera, et cetera. A and rarely do we have people call in or well, never talking about, you know, how they feel about themselves on a daily basis. What do they do on a daily basis to treat themselves well? Uh, do mm -hmm. things for themselves, acts mm -hmm. of services for themselves. In a way, it's like, you know, not like getting what you want or being selfish, but yeah, like having that relationship with yourself, I think is something, yeah, we all, we all struggle with. And as you say, in right. various degrees. And, and it's not something we have put value on necessarily, but I guarantee that you are calling in, in all your relationships, what you feel worthy of. Yeah. So for so, the people listening, how could, like, what are some basic steps of someone who's listening to this, who thought is listening is like, I've never considered that. Holy shit. What are some things that uh, f starting today they could do to better improve the relationship with themselves? Well, it starts with, it starts in the mind. A lot of times, you know, so we have something on the high level of 60,000 unconscious thoughts a day and thoughts create a feeling, right? And thoughts create a mood. And then we take action around our feelings. So it's really noticing it starts back to the thought, figuring out how am I speaking to myself? What's my, what's my perception of the world? Mm -hmm. Am I judging? Am I, how, what's the filter through which I'm viewing things? So starting to cull your thoughts and your thinking patterns is start there. And then where you can, if you notice where you're being hard on yourself, where you're being judgmental of self or whatever, whatever that is, however, that's showing up for you to replace that thought, say, hang on a second, I'm doing the best I can. Instead of doing affirmations in your morning, which are good, but you know, you're in the beta level activity brainwave. It doesn't really go down into the subconscious. It doesn't really take root, if you will, but it happens when you're on the ground. It happens in a moment like that. And also happens when you can put yourself in meditation. You talked about meditation before. So when you meditate, you're dropping down into brainwave activity levels. And it's when it's most receptive in the theta state. So when you can calm yourself, calm the brain patterns, calm the thoughts down, get space between the thoughts, that would be a time that you could impregnate the, the subconscious. That would be the time where you could really get those affirmations to work for you that I am, I'm doing the best I can. I like myself. I'm strong and powerful. I can call in any experience I choose. Like really, that would be the time to to do those rather than yeah. just, you know, running them off like a laundry list as you're getting out the door in the day or in your car when you're driving. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's knowing when to do them and really being an ally to yourself um, throughout your day on the ground. What are, What is the difference between the beta and theta state? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I honestly so now, don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in, there's, there's, there's gamma that's very fast brainwave activity. There's beta, which is what we're probably in right now. It's pretty fast and it's the conscious mind is super engaged. Below that is alpha. And we kind of dip into that throughout the day. And that's sort of when we're reading a book or when we're spacing out or sometimes we're driving from A to B and we don't know how we got to B. That's a form of trance, just so you know. It's, it's interesting. So we're not, it's not like hypnosis is something over there. We're actually all the time dipping into these states of trance. And then below that alpha state is theta. And when we're from the ages of zero to seven, theta, we're in that state most of the time. It makes sense, right? So you land in a human body and you're trying to categorize and qualify and quantify the world around you so you can be safe. So that's where you upload all the ideas about love, about safety, about abundance, about security, about um, um attraction, all those different parts and pieces happen at that time. And they go into that hard drive of the subconscious. Mm -hmm. So then here we are as adults, we don't really dip into that theta state as much to reprogram it, but we're the, the subconscious is downloading all these old child programming. And it really doesn't serve us in, in our adult life. And we find we're reactive. We find we're not in present time. We find, you know, we're not, um, responding appropriately to situations as they come down the pipeline. So that's a good key to show you that you're in those moments that happen. Oh my God, why did I react that way? That makes no sense mm -hmm. to know that's your subconscious. Fuck with you, you know, that's yeah. your subconscious downloading some programming that's like faulty in some way. So in hypnosis, we go into that place using your language and we upload what you want 
for your life going forward, how you want to see yourself, how you want to call in a loving relationship, how you want to show up in your purpose and, and for abundance to show up for you. So the subconscious is really running 95% of your life, most of which I think it's like 80 or something percent is negative habitual patterning of thoughts that are just going on the loop in those 60,000 thoughts a day. I can so you can yeah. do that. You don't need a hypnotherapist to do that. I'm happy to I work with people. I love doing it, but you also have the capability yourself and you can drop your own self. I mean, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. That's one of the founders of hypnotherapy says that. So just knowing it's the degree to which you allow yourself to drop into that state. So I can't make you do anything. So those people that were in your high school, they had a willingness to do that. There's a part of them that was willing to drop into that. And you might not have, it doesn't, it might not have felt safe to you. It might not have felt something that you were open to doing on some level, but it's the degree to which you allow yourself. So I can't make anyone do anything they don't want to do. I can't make sure. them agree to, um, wanting to be a certain way in their life when they're not in agreement with that, the subconscious will reject it entirely. So that's just good to know. It's like a little safety mechanism. So I can't control you. I can't manage you. It's really about what fits for you and tailored to you. Interesting. As mm -hmm. someone who for myself, um, I have a hard time staying or being present. What does that mean in mm -hmm. terms of what we just, what you just discussed in terms of like what for someone and so many of us are, uh, challenged by being present with some of the distractions we have on a daily basis. What state are we tend or do we tend to be in when we are not being present? I think we're just so identified with the thoughts. We're thinking we're the thoughts. And I mm -hmm. think when you're meditating, you, that's a great practice about meditation is you start to realize part of meditation is dropping past the thoughts. I'm the thinker. I'm not the thoughts themselves. So I'm not identified. I'm going to pick and choose which ones and, you know, doing a simple, you know, present moment awareness type meditation, which is really about just coming back to the breath, just come back to the breath. Oh, there's a thought. Guess what? My brain's off gassing. Cause that's what it does. It just thinks shit all the time. Blah, blah, blah. There it is not to judge it, but just come back to the breath. So it's just this gentle reorganizing and allowing thoughts to come on the screen of your mind and letting them go. And so that's so useful off the mat when you're not meditating, because during the day, again, oh, there's a thought that's not helpful, not constructive. It's actually destructive. I'm going to let that one go and I'm going to choose something else. So you, you start to drop past the person having all that, you know, um, that thinking and being kind of yanked around with that monkey mind and not being able to be present because all we have is the present moment. That's it. Everything is us trying to manage the past or trying to project into the future so we can manage you know, perceived dangers and they're not even real yet. It hasn't come. So it's really about why it's so important that mindfulness, that present moment is that this is the truth of right now is all that is, you know? So it, that's why we do, that's why we do meditation. And in that moment is happiness. We can choose that. And I prefer the word contentment. I feel like happiness. I know everyone says they're seeking happiness, but happiness is so slippery. It's so elusive. It feels like it's something imposed on us. Whereas contentment is something that we can curate from the inside out. It's something that we can decide. I'm content. I have everything I need. It's, it's actually goes, you know, um, arm in arm with gratitude. Mm -hmm. You can't really be in gratitude and also, you know, feel like there's not enough, you know, or you're missing or you're in lack. Sure. So gratitude is a great thing to cultivate, but they, they work well together. So for the person who, let's say they're going through a, a breakup or, and we, we talk to mm -hmm. these people a lot or, um, you know, their boyfriend or girlfriend left them, they're all upset. And then what's very common is I'm sure you probably know, there's we have a tendency of focusing all the thing on all the things we miss and we'll ignore the things that we're not happy about in a relationship. And when you're dealing with some of the people that you work with, what is some practices in terms of again, is it a meditation thing? Is it a hypnosis thing? Is it just again um you know folk seeing you know is it the relationship with yourself in terms of and that i i feel like it might be right we're like why mm -hmm. do we sometimes dismiss our own needs and i say this mm -hmm. a lot to our callers it's just like i can't tell how many times that they're always like they're always worried about what the person thinks of them right mm -hmm. does he like me what can i do what right. should i do to impress them etc cetera, etc cetera. and i hear them all the time and very rarely are they well do i like them what do I need from them? You know, does that, am I happy? Am I content? Or as you say, like, am I, 
Am I getting what I need from this relationship, whatever it is? And what are some practices and reminders that you, you recommend? Yeah, that's always a great gauge when you're looking at yourself through another person's eyes, you've kind of lost the thread of your relationship to self, right? So your own, your, I, when I, with my clients, I call that, look, you're an obsession. Let's just call it what it is. When you're trying to get and control and manage someone else's version of you, it's the yeah. mask and it's, you're in obsession. So let's just, as soon as you notice it, just call it out. This is an obsession and come back to yourself and say, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What's the next right action for me? Those are the three phrases that I always help is helpful to just like get back in my lane. This is, this is a fool's errand to try to manage their, the narrative for them. Mm -hmm. Cause people are going to think what they want. Let's set them free. They can, they can like you. They can not like you. I mean, that is a huge, it's easier said than done, but it is a practice to notice when that's happening and it's a leak, right? It's how we give away our power. It's how we stay out of our own experience. Cause maybe it's scary to be in our own experience. Maybe we don't like who we are. Maybe it's all those, th those are all those parts. So start there, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then knowing that if you're in partnership with someone and they're, they are highlighting things. They keep doing the same things over and over. That's, 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 they highlight the part of you that's in shadow, the part of you that needs healing. And it's just going to keep happening again and again in every single relationship until you stand still and make a note of that is like, why does that bother me? Why am I triggered? So they are, they're your great partner holding up the mirror. You know, we expect the other person to complete us in some way. We have all these ridiculous notions and especially us women with our Disney princesses. I mean, that's actually changing now. Um, I have small kids and I've been watching the new Disney movies and I'm like, wow, they really got the memo on that. It's about women taking care of themselves and, and becoming their own heroes, those things. But back in the day, it wasn't. We either died and like women were trying to kill us, our stepmothers. And like, so it's like we've had to come out from all this programming, you know, and there is no you complete me. That does not exist, Nick. It's like, this is, this is, this is why everything is, falls apart between people. You are your yeah. own vessel. You have, I have this idea that it's a triangle. You're both at the base triangle, both caring for yourself, both being fulfilled outside of the relationship. And then together you bring to the top of the triangle, the relationship is like a separate entity and it has to be in balance on the base. You have to have your friends, your life, your purpose, your, your, your ways that you're getting your needs met. You know how to self-soothe, know how to speak to yourself kindly and stop looking to that other person to do the heavy lifting you've been unwilling to do. It's unfair for them. And some people, you know, that's how these toxic relationships, everyone connects, all those broken pieces connect because someone is like, I'll do it for you, you know, and you'll love yeah. me and you'll be indebted to me. And then the other person's like, I'm going to resent the hell out of you because you're doing the work for me. I should be doing myself. Right. So if everyone is, has the goal and you know what, we're going to slip and slide. It's not always a through line, but if that is your intention, oh, I'm asking them to do this for me. Oh, I'm getting triggered and I'm making, and I'm making it about them. And I'm making, I'm telling them, you need to do this. You, when you catch yourself talking like that, you, you're off your center. So go back to that place where learning how to self-soothe, what tools work for you. And I love to give clients lots of tools. I, you know, tapping and um, meditations, one journaling, um, it's just so many, so many different practices to do and take a walk in nature, write about what's going on. Why are you triggered? Step away from your partner in that moment and say, you know what, this is not about you. This is about me. There's something in me that's being activated and I want to be with that. Instead of running from it and making it about you, I'm going to sit still and really see what's coming up for me. That's what being responsible for yourself looks like. I'm responsible for all my emotions and um, for the triggering that's coming up. I want the triggering to come up so I can heal. And you're doing that for me. Thank you so much. You are a great teacher. Right. That's a, that's a paradigm shift. Sure. So, and then, then, then if that your partner, then you're going to pull in someone who's going to be at that same level of integrity with themselves. And then both of you are going to funnel that into the relationship that you're sharing together. And that makes for something really strong and it, you really can let go of a lot of fantasies and um, that whole, you complete me paradigm pretty quickly. If you're looking for clean, wonderful indoor air, use essential oils that will not only do that, but will help with headaches, help yes. with anxiety, yes. sleep, yes. Uh, a great fresh in the uh, rise in the morning for yes. mental clarity. Stop using air fresheners and Glade plugins and stop burning cam candles that are full of carcinogens and toxins that are not good for you or your family. If you're on the go and you want a, something, a quick essential oil for, as Chrissy knows, yep. your roll-ons, 
Uh, great, especially for the people who suffer from headaches. Uh, yes. Stop taking ibuprofen every night. Stop taking it during the day. It's terrible for your stomach. Yeah. Um, try the non-invasive approaches first. It may not work for everyone, but I can't tell you how many of our customers have been really helped, especially who are suffer from headaches. Yeah, uh, for and sure. And roll on really go a long way to doing that. So check us out, nhoils.com, nhoils, that's plural, O-I-L-S, dot com. 30% off code Chrissy, K-R-I-S-S-Y, free shipping. And I think that's it. Check us out. Um, you know you'll love them. You'll be supporting a local business. Any uh, USDA Organic, uh, the highest quality essential oils you can find, nhoils.com. Yeah, because it almost, what you're saying you say you talk about this idea and we have our society of, again, the complete me. I want to find someone because I will be happy if this, if I mm-hmm. only had this in my life. And, and mm-hmm. it sounds like what you're saying is the opposite is quite true. If you aren't satisfied with yourself and you don't have a relationship with yourself, that uh, the person you get in a relationship with, will it will be the other way toxic in a way or damaging right. or like you said you, the the way you said it like if you aren't have if you have an unhappiness with yourself or things you handle the, your partner will only kind of highlight those things and, mm-hmm. and you know, almost no matter how perfect they are when people say i found the perfect guy then eventually they just get annoyed with each other and they, is that what you're saying in terms of it, it doesn't really matter what the partner does if you can't do it for yourself yeah. And also that, you know, if some, whoever's listening, if you're in a relationship and you feel like it's toxic, you know, start with you. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just see what you can shift and change about taking responsibility for yourself. Like we said, self-soothing, and then just see what then happens because it's a mathematical, you know, reality that if one thing shifts in an, in an equation, everything has to shift also. And so I think that's, that's, really a powerful concept of, you know, like we'll run into trouble in a relationship and then like, this guy's not good enough. I'm, it's, I need something else. And so it creates this cycle, this chain of like, my guy's out there, yeah, I've got to find him or, you know, this guy's, you know, this whole process, but really not standing still with your own stuff and really not being willing. And I know it sounds so boring and so unsexy. I get it, you know, cause we want that person to sweep in. Who's going to, all the pheromones and that happens and then it stops, right? We move through that quickly and we're mm. like, oh, it's just you. Okay. You know, like, so that's the, that's, <laughs> that's the part where, why that keeps happening over and over. Well, actually, no, it's actually you because you want that high, you want that buzz, you want that, you're not willing to stand still with your things. And so what if you're in the partnership that you're in and you could start saying, oh, wow, bringing that consciousness to it, letting them be them, giving them permission to do their stuff that they always do okay, that's fine. I'm going to focus back on me. How is this working out for me? How am I feeling? How am I doing? And it looks selfish, but it really, it will benefit everybody at the end of the day. I mean, you'll be a greater partner, greater parent, all the, all the greater, greater worker, greater citizen on the planet, truly, if you're taking care of your own needs within any paradigm. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought that up kind of what looks like or sounds selfish, but there's definitely a difference between working on yourself and giving you what you need so then you you can be a better in the world partner all these things versus saying i want other people to do this for me i want mm-hmm. this this is where i want to eat this is who i you know all those things yeah. cuz that you know expecting other thing other people to do what you want when you want it that's selfish you mm-hmm. taking the time to make sure that you're getting the nourishment from yourself mm-hmm. is Know, important so that then therefore you can maybe be like a giver and less selfish in, in a way mm-hmm. but it's yeah, just kind of sure. how it's all all framed um it's all very very fascinating uh mm-hmm. you have i haven't you, you say you talk a lot about soulmates or finding your own soulmate and and people certainly love the idea of soulmate one and only notebook mm-hmm. type of love right. is that something that you subscribe to the idea that we can find our soulmates in 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 a literal sense or 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 just whoever you end up with and that you're happy with is just by default your soulmate cuz f- full disclosure i don't like i don't believe in the traditional sense of right. there's this one person Mm-hmm. that I, I have to somehow magically find in the maze of a billion people. Right. It's just more finding the person who 
um, I don't know. I just, I guess, enjoy being around. Um, right. and, and then I'm, I'm, and we, I don't know, we have fun together. Uh, yeah, yeah. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? And then, you know, how do, can people quantify that? I think that's a, that's a real thing. And what I'm hearing you say is that, who do I, can I have fun with? And I feel my authentic self that I'm with, you know, like yeah. that could be, that's a great definition. Um, I have two thoughts. I feel like, you know, I feel like there's some soul contracts that happen. I think there's some agreements ahead of time and they're not always rosy, you know? So, so we can have, I, I definitely look back in my history um, and there's people that was a soulmate for that time, you know, and we had a sacred contract. They were going to push the shit out of my buttons and we were going to like, and I would have to really contract to be able to expand. And I would, they'd highlight all the things. So it wasn't the butterflies and rainbows that we expect. You know, it wasn't like the season finale on mm -hmm. the bachelor type deal, but it was, it was definitely sacred work. So those are, that's a soulmate too. So I guess it could be redefining that. I also, I have four kids. So, you know, my kids are soulmates in a sense. So it doesn't always have to be romantic. It's, it's about gravity. It's gotcha. about connection. It's about fulfillment when you're, when you're with someone. So that's how I'm defining it. So what if we expanded the idea of a soulmate, not pinned it on the relationship with a, with a romantic partner? What if we expanded that notion? Then it could also take the pressure off of finding that soulmate, you know? And I also feel like you can have a few, you know? Um, I, this is my second marriage and this, these vows were different. These vows were along the lines of, I'll love you for as long as I can, as long as it brings out the best in both of us, I'll work so hard to fight through every single block that comes up and I'm going to pull my weight. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I can't promise you forever. How, how, how can I do that? I don't know who I'm going to be in 20 years from now. I'm going to work hard and I'm not going to give up. But if it's something, you know, that that's, I think that's also realistic about a partnership too. So that's why I say part, I think, I think it's, it's open for this understanding that we can have a few and there no, can be I, twin yeah. souls. I, I love that. And kind of recently, as I've been thinking about stuff and relationships, I've kind of had this epiphany of I feel like we need to stop um, just deciding for ourselves that this is my forever person. I, that's mm -hmm. it. I found my person. And then we just, we stop uh, checking in with ourselves, with the relationship, and no matter what we do in the relationship and no matter what our partners do, we always just assume that this is our relationship. So then we start accepting our own shitty behavior or their shitty behavior, right. et cetera, et cetera, because we've just decided this, what this is, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, checking in. And by doing so, it may end up there for being forever because now we've, we don't mm -hmm. take it for granted. And, and sometimes when we, uh, throw out these kind of labels or just standards for ourselves that are impractical and we, we don't really know how to tangibly uh, approach it, then, yeah, I think we end up taking it for granted and we don't like work on the things we do. So I love that you say that because while it may not sound as romantic as till death do us part, uh, approaching it that way seems like a really more romantic way long term of yeah. I'm going to do the work and I'm not going to be afraid to say that mm -hmm. who knows what's going to happen. Right. But we, you know, by, but by doing so, we acknowledge that we will have to do work and we will have to do these things and, and we're willing to do it. And I, I, mm -hmm. I like putting it in those contexts. Yeah. And so much of, um, I love what you just shared. Yeah. And so much of what we think is that we're just trying to find our home with our person. And when we get, it goes back to what we've been talking about is our home is us. You know, we are our home. We are that person we've been seeking mm -hmm. and we've been seeking it high and low under rocks all over the place. And the world keeps telling us that it's about external things. It's about the bank account. It's about the wardrobe. It's about the car that you drive. And I've had all those things and it's just, that doesn't do it. And that, in fact, but at the height of that in my in my life, being in the epicenter of that, you know, I blew it all up. Um, and so, you know, that doesn't give you that's the rat race thing. So when when you when you make your own self your person, then you can move into partnership and say things like that and mean them. 
I'm going to be with you. I'm going to work really hard. And I pray to God that we can grow together along spiritual lines. That's, those are my words because that's how I define it. And what's happened is, you know, I've been in my relationship for a while and we have grown alongside each other and we've I definitely had our bumps, but it, it's, it's a beautiful thing when with time, as time marches on, if you're both conscious and you're both awake, it gets better and better and better. And I don't trust the butterflies. I just want to get to, you know, I just want to get to the real stuff. I don't yeah. trust all that, those feelings because they're fake, you know, and it's really my projections onto you. I want to know who you are now without all that, all those things are just, th those things are, those things frighten me because they can get you off course and just show me who you are. Sure. And let's, that's, that, that's more real. And then we can really get down to the work together and the fun, like you said, you know, cause it makes it fun when you're both awake and you're both doing the work yeah. on yourselves. It says here in, in, in my notes, you have some thoughts on the unimportance of physical attraction and uh, why that could be a distraction. <laughs> that's and not a great quote. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's a quote, but is that, is our, is, is, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, mm. Is you know, someone who I've always valued my physical attraction mm -hmm. and my partners, recognizing that, you know, looks fade and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot more to that. But we often, you know, it, it is often the first thing that draws us into someone, that physical attraction. And, um, you know, what are, you know, how do you balance that out? And could you maybe put it in your words uh, as opposed to? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Sure, Nick. Well, from what I know from the subconscious, the subconscious, as I explained before, it's it's calling in everything to you based on its hard drive, you know, what it's yeah. wired to feel attracted to. So if you're attracted to, you know, you've had a childhood where a parent wasn't very, very present or loving or rejecting or you were abandoned or different like that, you're going to be attracted to someone who's emotionally unavailable. And so you'll be like, that's my type. You know what I mean? He's, he's, he's just sort of like too cool for school and he's just not really quite into me. Like, and you're going to be attracted to that. That's going to be sexy to you. So that's the part I think where that's why I was saying that. So I don't always trust because the subconscious has its own agenda. But if you're working with that, then um, you might also call in. You might also be attracted to someone. Those are when like the C's part and you see that person, you're like, oh, it's you. There you are. You know, those things. And that doesn't mean that that is not valid to have that story, but be, be cautious. Be cautious. So wait, are, that, are, that, are you that, saying that my sometimes general aloofness and, <laughs> and um, disinterest in life, or at least the impression of it, is the reason why I sometimes uh, attract uh, uh, beautiful women with daddy issues who have... <laughs> is that, is I don't that know, what you're Nick. saying? <laughs> <laughs> It looks, oh, like Nick. it looks like you're realizing you right now. Yeah. I'm just like, I don't <laughs> try. It's not like a thing I'm doing. It's just like, I'm kind of, you know, I'm a heady guy. I can be aloof. I can kind of be, um, I can be very emotional and expressive, but not always. And I, mm -hmm. I've, people often find me hard to read. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and I've realized, I've noticed throughout my life that, it has attracted people towards me and interesting and yeah. uh it's like well, damn it do you like me or am i just reminding you of your childhood shit That's funny. Um, yeah probably some of that nick um do you are you easy to read for yourself like could you have a good handle on what's going on as I, things I, are moving through you i think so i'm okay i pride myself in being self-aware and, and i'm good at reading people i'm, mm. I'm, I'm good at that and I think maybe if I'm just thinking off my feet, why sometimes I'm hard to read because I'm constantly analyzing the world around me and I'm reading other people. And I think that kind of puts up what seems to be this kind of mysterious wall. And, and I don't, uh, as I've gotten older, I've become a little more guarded, you know? Yeah, and so I don't easily, I, I like to keep my circle small. I pride myself mm -hmm. on loyalty. I, you know, uh, I like, and so, but I don't let people into that circle of, of people I plan on being very loyal to. And I, mm -hmm. I don't let people in that quickly. And, and yeah, so then I think that's probably. All well, Nick, things. that seems smart. That seems like self-care when, because I'm sure you've been burned. I know, you know, you're, 
have had the past that you've had in the spotlight and different things. So it, it's going to attract certain, certain circus and certain monkeys, if you will. So knowing that, I think that's good self-care knowing that you have your guard up and you're, you know, making sure there's gates of entry to make sure people get past certain hoops to get into your space. I don't think, I don't think that's a negative thing. I think yeah. that's so, practical. So for someone like myself, if you, know, you, you meet someone, you like them, you guys like each other and you're just mm -hmm. kind of aware of that and you're just like, Oh, well, you know, you get to know the person and they talk mm -hmm. about their childhood and how like, you know, they love their parents, but yeah, they didn't have the best relationship with their dad. And you're like, oh shit, did I attract you that way? Does that mean the relationship's doomed? Or how do then no. once you identify why you might be, there's an attraction there and I'm sure there's more to it. What can you do with that information? Like, do you just be like, oh, well, we must break up because you don't really authentically like me. I'm just reminding you of like things that you're trying to find through your subconscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, no, I don't think there has to be, I mean, there might be red flags for someone who consistently says, you know, I have daddy issues and I'm not willing to explore those or excavate those with in therapy, or I'm not willing to, you know, deep dive and they seem totally unconscious. Yeah. Run for the hills. You know, I would say that if they're not, if they haven't done the work and they're not willing to do the work and they're not aware that they would be projecting that onto you. I think that's self-care and just say, you know what, this, I don't know if this is going to work out before it even gets off the ground. Um, sure. So you could gauge where they're at and what their level of um, awareness is. And so that that's a really good way to, to check things out. And I think if we're pulling in the same person over and over again, that's on us, right? That's something that we're doing that. I had a moment of that myself back when I was dating, I kept pulling in the same emotionally unavailable person and I was like, why does this keep happening? I'm like really working so hard in so many other areas. And then it really became the last stop, Charlie, on because I'm withholding from myself because I'm where I don't feel like I'm worthy. So I'm mm -hmm. pulling in this person that keeps holding up the mirror. I'm not enough. So they keep playing that out for me over and over again. But you see, again, it's me taking responsibility. And I actually closed that loop. I think when you, we absolutely have that capacity, when we notice it, when we're aware of it, when we acknowledge it, and then, um, I was willing to let them go, you know, because again, my relationship to myself matters the mo more than anything else. But that was, you know, at that time. And then I pulled in right after that, I met my husband. It totally didn't fit that profile at all. So we can heal ourselves and we can pull in a different animal, if you will. But it takes awareness and it takes um, dedication. So there's that. Does Interesting. That, does that help? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then on the flip side, so many of us have a way of sabotaging uh, our relationships, uh, when we do find someone or, you know, who might be a, a healthy option for us, uh, why do we do that? And, and what are some ways to recognize that we might be doing it to avoid doing it in the moment? About sabotaging relationships? Yeah, kind of like, yeah, self-sabotage, you know. Right. Uh, well, maybe doing the, the things question, that will prevent us from finding or reaching out to these people as opposed to attracting the wrong kind of people. Mm -hmm. Well, I think knowing that that's, I think we play the victim of this, these things where we say there's nobody good out there. We tell, have all these, these narratives that we run, you know, there's no, there's no good guys left. There's no, all these different phrases and things. And I think knowing that, no, it's me. I'm the problem. I'm the common denominator here. What is it that I'm manifesting? What is it that I feel worthy of? What is it that I'm, you know, putting out there? What are my expectations? You know, some I work with so many women that truly are just, you know, I'm ready for love, but he's just not showing up and those things. And it's like, no, somewhere you're not somewhere you're afraid somewhere. It's not okay for you to step into that somewhere. You're not ready and that's okay, but let's just own it. Yeah. Let's just sit in that for a second and let's figure out why, what happened? What didn't you, what happened in the last relationship? Let's unpack that. Let's really mine that because it's juicy. It's good. There's clues there. And then we'll, you know, we'll go into the subconscious. So there's a couple of ways, but if you're doing this on your own, there's, there's something really potent about making a timeline and writing every single relationship you've had that's mattered to you on a, just like draw a straight line and then draw the dots of where those are and then write the characteristics of those relationships. 
and then see how they're all similar. See, it's like it's like doing yeah. a puzzle. The relationships, not even so much the partner, right? And like right. the dynamic the of the relationship, how yes. you guys fought, what you did. Yeah. That's right. What were the themes? What were the things? Yeah. You can do, this is like years of therapy that you can do for yourself in that moment. And then see which of those remind you of something from your childhood, something from your parent. And I guarantee you're going to see strains of your dad or strains of mom. We all had that. It's not like that you're those girls you're pulling and have daddy. Most yeah. people do because we have unresolved issues and we think it can get fixed outside of us. So when oh, you take yeah. responsibility and sit and make that list and see that on paper and you're like, geez, you know, there it is again and again and again. And so this is the part that I need to focus on. I need yeah, to no, focus on whatever that is. Yeah. Totally. And it's sometimes a, a weird, and I've thought about this. I, I talk mm -hmm. about my childhood and I, I always say this. I had a great childhood, great parents, but we think about parenting and like it's not, there's no exact science behind parenting. And especially 20, 30 years ago, people were having kids younger, mm -hmm. right? In their mid to early 20s, they're still figuring their shit out. And then, like, we take for granted that maybe even though while our parents are great overall and we had great childhoods, once in a while they might have gotten something wrong. And maybe yeah. it kind of fucked us up a little bit, a little hardwire here, a little bit of there. Maybe there's some Catholic guilt and some shame and attributed that they passed down from their parents, et cetera, et cetera. And while we're generally happy and we have a great relationship with our parents, there's some shit we have to figure out or that is affecting our current relationships that we, we refuse to acknowledge because considering the possibility we didn't have these beautiful childhoods, is something is, is, is we're afraid to admit to ourselves. And I think that's very mm -hmm. interesting for you to say, like sometimes just putting it out there or writing this down or making this line, I love that you said that, is, isn't suggesting that maybe like your parents were the monsters you didn't realize mm -hmm. or anything like that. We're, we mm -hmm. all fuck, you know, God, parenting seems so scary when you're just mm -hmm. like, cause there is no playbook. There is no way to do it. You know, there yeah. is no right way and different personalities. And yeah, it's, it's kind of fascinating. Yeah. And sometimes we overcorrect, right? It's like, it's like, I'm not going to be my parent. And then you do this other, you swing far right a different way and do it that. So it's, it's, it really, there is no rhyme and reason. And again, I love how you pointed out. It doesn't mean we had these monstros monstrosity childhoods. Do you know, it doesn't have to yeah. be that it's also not just what your parents parented, but it's what they modeled. It's how they modeled abundance. It's how they modeled um, productivity. It's how they modeled affection and love and safety. So it's not only what they said and how they tutored you, if you will, or mentored you through your childhood, but it's how they lived it, how they lived their lives. That's what we're looking to. Those are the, the, the cues that we pick up more even than what was said over and over and over in the household. So that's a good look. And then also knowing that we carry ancestrally different burdens, you know, different um, through different messaging that gets passed on and passed on and passed on and you can go all the way back. So there's so many, you know, meditations you can do. I know this sounds way woo, but you could sit and do these meditations where you can literally have your ancestors line up in front of you and be like, I give you back this and have them turn around and have them give it back to their parent and then go back. You can see this chain going down. And I have had so many people do this and literally feel a weight lifted because these things matter. They seem like we're just imagining them, but we carry all these aspects within ourselves, our inner child, our subconscious, our conscious mind, our ego, our shadow self, our the masks that we wear. We're, you know, our mind, body, spirit. Like there's just so many aspects that make up this, what you see and what you feel, right? So yeah. it's knowing that some of them are more developed than others. Some of them are not in alignment <laughs> with others. Like we talked about the subconscious and the conscious mind, the conscious mind wants something. The subconscious is like, no, it's not safe. We're not doing that. You know? And yeah. so they're, they're, in, they're at odds with each other. So um, it's knowing that you're a complex system and being, and to have utmost compassion and just, you know, not coming at this like, Oh, I've got to do self-development, but it's just like, Oh, let me get curious. Let me get curious about me. Wow, look at me getting really reactive over here. Like, so I think that's the part that you want to bring the lens of curiosity, the lens of self-love. And I don't say that, you know, lightly. It truly is self-loving to be curious, to be present with your triggers, to know that it's you're responsible for everything you're feeling and all the choices you're making that your subconscious is calling in. That's all you. That's all on you. So let's unpack it and let's do it gently. Let's do it swiftly and let's do it ruthlessly but also compassionately, yeah. <laughs> ruthless and compassionate. They can coexist.
Totally. Um, mm. Yeah, this is this has been great. And just before, just, I, maybe we've already touched on it, but when you say you said shadow self a couple times, mm. and just for the people listening, because hey, we've all heard of ego and things like that, but what do you mean by shadow self? Shadow is the part that we disown, the part that we want to hide completely, the parts of us that aren't desirable, you know, That's that right. we're angry, that we're um, judgmental, that we're um, greedy, that we're jealous, that we're, those are the parts that we push down into the basement. They can be things that happened in childhood to also that we just shove down. I can't deal with it. And so that's tied to the mask that we wear that is usually the opposite. Like, wow, I'm so spiritual. Wow, I'm so giving. Wow, I'm so, so codependence is a great one where wow, I'm such a giver. Wow, I do so much for everybody else. Wow. And then underneath that seething cauldron in the basement of the shadow is, you know, I did this, they owe me this. Yeah. You know, this is all of that. You, you see how that, that, how it can be two things. The yeah, mask looks totally. so helpful and loving and, and underneath that is selfish demanding, um, uh, wanting to control and manage other people and their decisions, feeling like, you know, what's best. It's so lack of humility. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's I, just, I hear it's, it a lot. So it's like, Oh, I'm such a giver. And I'm always <laughs> giving this to my, these guys I'm dating and they never want to give it back, you know? Mm. Uh, and then always, they always leave me. And, and yeah, mm. it's, I hear that a lot. And we, we, mm -hmm. we do that a lot. And we, it's, um, I'm, I'm glad that you pointed that out. Because you're not giving from overflow. You're giving yeah. from lack. Yeah. You're giving from a place of need and want and re demand of return. So you're tallying all of it. That is codependent. You know, that is a place of, um, that's a bottomless pit and never gets solved that way. So you want to give from overflow. So that means you're tending to your needs. You're taking care of yourself. You're doing all the things you need to do to be happy and joyous and free, all those points. And then you're giving from that place. And if you can't just opt out, I don't have it in me. Can't do it. Sorry. So it's setting boundaries. It's saying no when you mean it. Those things. Interesting. So, and just kind of sum it all up. It sounds like a lot of what you're doing is in kind of an our adult state uh, mm -hmm. when needed, almost kind of reprogramming some of the hard wiring that we did when we were younger and living in that theta state and developing all these kind of out of, body kind of thoughts and, and, and kind of breaking it down because maybe some of that hard wiring wasn't, wasn't wired properly and we might yeah. have to, to reassess it. And, and then in a way in an adulthood, we can mm -hmm. tap into that so that we can maybe, you know, be more content as you say, and, and hopefully happy, you know, that's a moving scale. Um, Nick, you're such a good listener. Thanks. <laughs> I don't, Jeez. you know, I'm good at talking, but sometimes I'll surprise people. <laughs> no. Yeah. You're fully uh, absorbing all that's well, well summed. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, that, this is really great. And I really appreciate you uh, sharing. And I, I know the people listening will uh, really appreciate, enjoy and appreciate it. Uh, where can people find you if they want to learn more about what you're doing or even work with you? The, the best place to reach me where I'm most current is on Instagram. I'm at Ryan Haddon coach. You can find everything there. Okay. And then yeah. you do like, you can, you work with people digitally, like if they were interested in working with you. I and, do. I and, work and, with people. Um, yeah. One-on-one -on -one. I do group coaching. I'm doing a course right now. I'm so excited about it. It's the second time this year. It's called the relationship triumvirate and it's everything we just talked about. It's relationship to self, you know, to a module on that relationship to others and relationship to something greater. So really unpacking those three, you know, dynamics and letting go of anything that's not, you know, for the highest in any of those three and really developing those out. So we do that in, a, in three modules over six weeks and it starts end of October. So I'm excited about that one. And then, um, you know, I write for Poosh. I'm their in-house life coach, which is Courtney Kardashian's uh, website. So I write all of their articles there. And there's a lot of things on things we touched on today, radical acceptance and emotional unavailability, being woke in relationships, um, manifesting a partner and so all those. I love Interesting. It. Yeah. Are you, do you hypnotize people like via zoom? Is that a thing? Can I do. do that? Yeah, it works. It's, it's amazing. Huh. I just did this morning right before I jumped on this call client we're doing hypnosis. Yeah, no, it's actually it helps people because they're in their own homes. They're comfortable. Whereas you come into a doctor's office, you're sitting in a doctor's chair or, um, you know, a hypnotherapist chair. It's like, you, you already feel like you're out of your elements. You know, Have so you ever actually, hypnotized someone on air or like on a podcast format? 
No. <laughs> Why you want to be hypnotized, Nick? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Do I? I don't know. I think I know we could. Let's just clean things up down in the basement down there and get you like right with where you want to be at this point in your life. Sure. Uh, anytime. Uh, well, yeah, maybe. We'll see. Okay. Okay. You have to be Good. open to it so you can accept it so that you can fall yeah, into that I don't state. Know. I'm 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 I want to try it just because I know again it wasn't a one on one it was a group thing. Mm -hmm. I guess you could consider me a bit of a cynic or a non-believer in it. I believe it. I'm not like I know clearly there is a science behind it. I just I can't grasp my brain around mm -hmm. being hypnotized and I guess there is a resistance there that it does fascinate me and would like to to try it. Yeah, I think knowing that you're in hypnosis throughout your day more than you know, you're dropping into it and that it's the degree to which you allow yourself to. Mm -hmm. And then I have certain um, hypnosis inductions that I use for people that have really busy minds. So I'm like, here, give this to the conscious mind to ruminate over it. I'm just going to be working over here with the subconscious. And what's so nice about one on one versus a group is that it's your language, it's tailored to you, it's what you specifically want, it's words that resonate to you. So we're coming up with that together. And then it just makes the subconscious more receptive because it's familiar. We'll have to try it sometime. We'll see what yeah, the Nick, audience anytime. thinks. Well, then we'll record it. And then okay. I'll be like, guys, sorry, I said too much. <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I can't put this out in the world. Yeah. Uh, well, Ryan, thank you so much. Yeah. It's been a ton of fun. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I know people will find this helpful. And for those of you listening, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to uh, rate us uh, five stars on iTunes uh, and uh, send your questions at asknickacastmedia.com, cast with a K. And if there is nothing else, we will see you on Monday. <laughs>